Conrad. Hello, Guy. How are you today? I'm great. Hey, your agency hasn't been purchased, has it? No, it hasn't. Have you done any purchasing? Nothing. I'm a big loser in the acquisition space. I Maybe you're a winner. Acquisitions huh. are hard to make happen, right? Really, we seem to talk about them a lot on this show. So we're going to move on from the acquisitions, but beware that even in our little agency space, we are seeing lots and lots of acquisitions and mergers. That's happening. So more and more attention coming to the legal space from people with loads of money. I don't know yeah. that that's good for everyone, except for me and Guy. Yeah, lawyers beware. There was a, I think it was on LinkedIn, there was a thread talking about this kind of the nexus of non-lawyer owned law firms and what the impact of money coming into that space is going to be. So stay tuned, folks. It's probably going to be a topic we're going to talk about again, but we're going to try to talk about it less. <laughs> stay tuned because we are going to try and get someone, a non-lawyer in Utah to come on the show, even though we don't have show guests, right? That's a policy. We're not doing guests, but that would be an interesting conversation to have. If you're listening and you're a quote unquote non-lawyer, also known as a human being, Wow, and, dude, that's cold. Well, non non lawyers cold. What kind of <laughs> kind of word is that? In any event, uh, and you own a law firm in Utah, give us a holler. Get a hold of us. Okay, today we're not going to talk about that because we're going to talk about that later. We are going to do in the news some Google wrap up as usual because there's always Google stuff to talk about. We're going to talk about gee the ABA tech report that just came out, right? Numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. We're going to go into the ABA tech report for our numbers section. We're going to go into the word of the day covering a word or a three-letter acronym that most of you don't know what it stands for, but all of you should. U-T-M. Oh, I thought it was W-T-F. No, this is a, a child-appropriate. Actually, right now the language <laughs> is going to devolve because the last thing we're going to talk about is dumb shit lawyers do. And let's roll that beautiful music. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Before we get started, we wanted to thank our sponsors. Law Yaw provides end-to-end -end document automation for solo, small, and mid-sized practices. Save time and avoid mistakes with documents that you draft over and over again. Learn more at lawyaw.com. That's L-A-W-Y-A-W.com. And thanks to Alert Communications for sponsoring this episode. If any law firm is looking for call, intake, or retainer services available 24-7, 365, just call 866-827-5568. And before we go to the next one, I want to remind you guys that last time we talked about our number was 91%. That was 91% of phone calls get answered. That means you're blowing 9% of your marketing budget just by not answering the phone. So hook up with something like Alert. And also LexisNexis Interaction, the leading client relationship management solution purpose-built for the way law firms engage with their clients. Learn more at interaction.com. All right, let's hit the news. So, Guy, yeah. we've been lying to everyone about Google Screened. Uh, misleading. Um. Misleading. <laughs> D uh, not deliberately misleading. But apparently, we're seeing some new information coming out of what Google calls local service ads, what you guys should know as Google Screened. Actually, can you explain Google Screen for everyone if someone's just catching up? Yeah, you get a nice little green checkbox next to your name saying that you're endorsed by Google at the top of the search results. At the very tippy top with a green checkbox that says Google Guaranteed. So... When this rolled out, I was very excited that it was going to go into the local search results to try and get rid of a lot of the spam that's showing up there. And I was wrong. And Google told me that these ads were only going to show up at the top and the checkbox would only show up if you were paying for the ads. But what we've seen in the HVAC industry, not legal yet, but in HVAC, is those Google screen checkboxes, which in, in HVAC is called Google Guaranteed, are actually showing up in the local search results. So perhaps 
coming to a three pack near you, Google screened. Let me ask you this, because I know that there was a little bit of a question about this. If you have an LSA running, does that mean you can't have a traditional ad also running in the same result? Oh, no. Double up, triple you can up. Double up. Go that's mad. A good, that's a good one to know, too. It is a good one. And you should, like, I mean, he's making a really good point. Own as much of that real estate as you can in as many of the places. There are now four pieces of real estate where you can plant your flag. If only this was a webinar, we could show people a visual to to close their eyes. Mm, Yeah. So just imagine Smith & Jones Law Firm all over those search results because you now have that option as long as you have a really deep bank account in some cases. All Smith & Jones all the time. Okay, now Smith and Jones also might be interested in knowing that they can launch audio only ads directly through Google and YouTube. So this is coming out new. It's it's basically radio via Google and YouTube that launched, I want to say, 48 hours ago. So if you have access and want to get into the uh, the beta on that, find a premier Google partner to talk to and see if you can get in because it might be a new thing. Why are they doing this? What's the point of this? I suspect there is a great opportunity for Google to make some money by getting lawyers to spend money on radio ads, right? But on YouTube, I mean, maybe they're testing it so they can use it on like a podcast network or something. That would be a good idea. Like this network? Or, you know, whatever. But (laughs) I I just, it seems so odd to me that it's like, okay, you're sitting there on YouTube getting ready to watch whatever amazing children unwrapping presents. Is that what people watch on YouTube these days? Well, so I think maybe what we're dealing with here is a lot of people are just listening to YouTube, right? So like just listening my, to YouTube. Yeah. I mean, you, you put it, you can run music through YouTube. There's all sorts of stuff that you can do just audio. Okay. Right. And I mean, we are living in this multi-screen multimedia relate environment all the time. And it may be something where that quick voiceover ad can be effective. Don't know. We'll find out. Interesting. Okay. Let's talk about the ABA 2020 tech report. We will talk about it. If you just search for 2020 ABA tech report, there's some really interesting data in there, Uh, especially for us. You know, we talk websites and marketing, but I don't want to spoil it. So I'm not going to share the numbers. Teaser. So this is the teaser to stay and listen through to the numbers. So I know you've spent a bunch of time looking at both the Clio growth report as well as the ABA tech report. Are they painting a similar picture, Guy? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think uh, Clio's is a more optimistic view of where lawyers are. I mean, I, I think they both identify some real opportunities for improvement for law firms. Um, you know, uh, Clio talks a lot about the um, utilization rates, but I don't know. I, you know, I, when, when we talk about some of these numbers, I think also some of it is, is just the audience, the survey respondents. So Clio survey respondents, Clio users probably trend a little bit more savvy. You know, the ABA is kind of more like the wide open lawyer legal industry at large. And so I think that I think it sheds some light on the stratification of the legal industry. You know, there's some very, very sophisticated savvy lawyers, and there are some that are um, need to hop on the tech train. Okay. Interesting question though, Conrad. Yeah. I mean, if, if you were, so we're going to move on to the word of the day. If you were to suggest to an attorney, read Clio growth, ABA tech report, or both, what would you say? I would say both. They're not that long. If you really twisted my arm, I think there's a little bit more tactical. I mean, I, I always tell lawyers all the time. I'm like, you can build your whole marketing plan around the Clio trends report. Right. My view, but there's some okay. interesting data in there. We'll talk about it, some of it. Word of the day. Okay, kids. Today's word of the day is UTM parameters. Now, I'm wondering how many people are going to get that reference. Cowboy Uh, Curtis. Hit us if you get the reference. So, Guy, UTM, that is a phrase that marketers throw around all the time. Can you first tell us what it stands for. No, you're going to tell us what it stands for because in the show prep, you actually pulled this and uh, I knew the first two, but I didn't, I didn't get modules. So. All right. So UTM stands for urchin tracking module back in the day. And I go way, way, way back here. Urchin was a small, a very small kind of insignificant 
Google uh, Analytics, I was going to call it a Google Analytics platform. It was an mm -hmm. analytics platform that Google bought. And when they purchased Urchin to turn it into Google Analytics, the way Urchin tracked things was with this thing called UTM parameters. Yeah! And the UTM... <laughs> I love it. I Watch this. UTM. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try and not walk into that trap again, but... These parameters are essentially, you can see them on URLs with a question mark equals, and then there's a bunch of gobbledygook behind that. Can you go, and, and so the thing with Google, when, when they bought Urchin, they did not want to lose all the tracking infrastructure that had already been built in for Urchin's customers. And so instead of adding and creating a new googly type term, they maintained UTM as their tracking infrastructure. So Guy, can you tell me what these are, how they work, and what we look at? Okay, kids, this is really important stuff. And we're going to talk about it in the context of marketing this podcast. But Conrad, as if you've been listening, you know that we're going to have a competition. And one of the things that we need to be able to do is to attribute our campaign efforts. So when Conrad decides to go out and share a link on Twitter or do an ad or put it in his email, we want to know that, that the click that came from that came from Conrad's campaign versus Guy's campaign. And so what these urchin tracking modules do yeah! is <laughs> tell your analytics tool information like the source. So it could be the refer, like Google or a newsletter, the medium, cost per click, banner ad, email, the content, so if you're testing different versions of your content, which you should be, uh, you can differentiate ad creative and track better performing ad creative, and then campaign. And so in, you know, in the context that we're going to do for the marketer versus marketer competition, the campaign would be just agree is going to be simply Guy for my campaigns and Conrad for his. But it doesn't just apply to podcasts. That's the thing I, I think is really important for us to, to nail is that everything that you do especially if it has ad dollars behind it, should have some of these parameters on the URL so that you can actually you know, look in your analytics profile and say, hey, this campaign that uh, I did, whether it's a Google Ads campaign or a Facebook campaign or a paid social promotion or a banner ad or display network, you can actually tie it back because that's the only way you can get to return on ad spend, return on investment, target cost per client by channel or medium or campaign. And it's it's really, really important. One of the other things, I'll just give one kind of final, we, we promised at the very beginning we'd, we'd stay super tactical. One of the things that everyone should be doing is using these UTM parameters to track <laughs> search. <laughs> oh, darn it. I, I stepped in it by, by accident that time. You should use these parameters to determine whether or not your traffic is coming from local, right? So are you getting a ton of traffic from local? Because if you don't use the UTM parameters, you will end up munging all this data in with your other organic. And that is th those are two very fundamentally different channels. GA does not report on those independently unless you take advantage of this type of tracking. Super, super important. In fact, I'm going to belabor this point because it's so important. Um, what Conrad's talking about here is making sure that you use the tracking mechanism <laughs> <laughs> on your Google My Business listing. You can use it in the main URL. You can use it in your appointment URL. You can use it in your post URLs. Uh, and in addition to uh, tracking and analytics, the real gold, the secret magic SEO gold, Shh. is you can track the queries in Search Console that your Google My Business listing is populating for. So, you know, classic paradigm, you want to know how you're showing up in the local pack for searches like Chicago criminal defense lawyer. This is how you do it. And so basically it segments out the impressions, clicks, and positions for your Google My Business listing from your traditional organic listings in your, your main website. Really, really, really important. In fact, you know, I, I think I, most ma most agencies are on this now, right? <laughs> Come on, you are being so charitable. Are you trying to poke me again? It says charitable right in the uh, show notes here. So 
let, let, I was in my head as you were talking, I was going to say, hey, Guy, is there any good reason why an agency wouldn't let you have access to this type of data? And then I thought, you know what, Conrad, don't be such an asshole. <laughs> and then you're like, you know what, Conrad, you know you are that. And then you moved right, you pushed me right into it. So let's not, let's not pretend this is, uh, you know, different. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and one other thing too, that I think, because we, I, it was important for us to give some tactical and, you know, we're SEO dorks. So we went down that road, but you know, it's interesting too. I think as we talk about in the context of marketing the podcast, there are some other tools out there that are podcast specific. We're playing around with Chartable which is really interesting because we believe, and I think a lot of the um, podcast networks are on Chartable, but even just going through the experience of how they present, they've got these magic links that include the ability to track performance by URL, and also we believe are going to um, increase the likelihood of subscribers. So, and we'll, we'll touch base back on that because this is really an experimental phase with them, but they have a section that talks about these tracking mechanisms. So brief aside, if you're running a podcast and you want data, check out Chartable. This podcast not brought to you by Chartable. <laughs> Guy and I are working to figure out how their tracking mechanism works. And they basically have two different versions, what they call source ID, as well as what looks to be a replication of this Google UTM parameter. Um, <laughs> you, you did that on purpose. I did actually do that on purpose. But... We'll see how that pans out. But again, if you're running a podcast, check out Chartable. It's fascinating. And perhaps next month, we will have more insight on exactly how Chartable handles Google Analytics type tracking versus their own internal tracking. And now for a quick break. The right client relationship management solution enables and empowers firm growth. LexisNexis Interaction is designed specifically for law firms and embeds client intelligence at the heart of every interaction, providing valuable insights into client relationships so you can make strategic decisions about how to focus your resources to gain more business. Learn more and request your free demo at interaction.com slash lunch hour. No one cites routine drafting as the reason they chose to become a lawyer, but that's where a lot of time goes for solo practitioners and small firms. LawYaw can help you transform your existing Word documents into reusable templates with no coding required. Save time and avoid errors with intuitive features like conditional logic. Use a tool that empowers your experience and expertise. Learn more at LawYaw.com. That's L-A-W-Y-A-W.com. All right, happy listeners. Now, as we always do, we're going to read reviews because we want your feedback, good or bad. Although if it's bad, send it to us as an email so it doesn't make us look bad. That's another good tip for your law business. Ask for the bad reviews via email. Ask for the good ones publicly. So I'm going to read this. This comes from Dina Cataldo. I am a lawyer and a marketing geek, so I may be a bit biased, but I love this show. Conrad and Jim... Dina, you've just insulted Guy. Not at all. <laughs> I actually, maybe I should change my name to Jim. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, it's yeah, anyway. Well, James. Uh, I suppose you get the FYI as opposed to the GYI autocorrect, and sometimes it turns into Jim. Oh, I get tons of autocorrect, my name. Okay. We're, we're really butchering this review, though. Okay, sorry, back to the review. <laughs> I love hearing Conrad and Jim help lawyers think differently about being a lawyer. A lot of lawyers I work with tend to believe that marketing is hard or confusing, but these guys break it down in a way that makes it easier to understand. They also make it fun. I highly recommend this podcast. Dina, that, that is very, very nice of you. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for that review. Appreciate that. If you have a review, please do head over to Twitter and hashtag it LHLM to let us know that you left one, or you can go directly to Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to review podcasts is. All right. As promised, we're going to jump into By the Numbers. And the number here is less than half. But what we mean by less than half, I'm just going to read the whole paragraph here. It's very short. And this is from the uh, 2020 ABA Tech Report websites and marketing. According to the portion of the 2020 survey covering websites and lawyer marketing, less than half of law firms of all sizes have a marketing budget, comma, <laughs> and only 32% of firms from two to nine lawyers and 14% of solo respondents say their firms have marketing budgets as compared with 63% from firms of 10 to 49 lawyers. 
wow. I mean, is it wow? I don't know. I mean, we, we experience this every day. So I have this experience, and I think it's an interesting, we're, we're going through this annual planning with all of our clients right now. And even as you talk to prospects, Guy, I, I have this conversation regularly where it seems like some law firms, many law firms, when you say, what do you want to do is we want to grow. And they say, how much? Oh, bigger than last year. How much bigger? I don't know, but bigger. And so it's really hard to kind of build a marketing plan for bigger, right? Or grow. And there are very few times, Guy, and I don't encourage this. I don't know if you do this with your clients, but there are very few times where someone will say, we have 20,000 a month to spend. We have four thousand dollars set aside a month where our job as agencies is to squeeze as much out of a fixed budget as possible do you i mean i'm gonna say one in ten looks at it that way maybe charitably is that, is that your feel Guy? is that your experience yeah definitely and you know we try to encourage one of the things we have to do is is to start having conversations about how do you craft a marketing budget because it's, it's easy for us to say what's your marketing budget and they say we don't have one and then we say, okay, let's just throw something against the wall. But I think that's a disservice. I mean, you really need to think about your marketing budget in the context of your firm financials, right? So, you know, if I, if I arbitrarily come up with a number of, you know, $10,000 a month, right? So $120,000 a year, and your revenue is 200000 a year, that's a pretty high <laughs> market. 50% of your total revenue going to right. marketing, uh, that's pretty high. And so um, this is actually one, there's a, uh, you know, as a board member of the um, ABA Tech Show board this year, one of our sessions in the marketing track will be coming up with a budget. How do you come up with a budget? And even beyond just marketing, but budgeting in general, I think it, this is just one of those things. It's, you know, we lawyers talk about this all the time. Like they don't teach budgeting in law schools. They don't teach business in law school. You can't, it's just so hard to give any kind of salient advice to someone about marketing and growth and projections and forecasts and return on ad spend and target cost pers and all that stuff without having some frame of reference to a budget in the context of the larger financials, right? And I would say that budget, I mean, there's lots of ways to do the budgeting, but I think you need to start with like, what are we trying to do next year? What is our business objective? And, and you know, there's lots of different good answers to that. That answer might be, hey, I'm trying to survive COVID until the middle of the year and I'm going to pop my head up, but we're going we're gonna to turtle for as long as we can financially and just survive. Some of it might, I mean, you, your goal might be, I want to do a 30% revenue increase. Your goal might be, I want to open one office, another office. Your goal might be, I want to hire two more attorneys. So there's lots of different goals. Or, or if you're in PI, one of the goals that we see most frequently is, I want to have X number of matters per month because your matters are going to take 24 to 36 months to settle out anyway. So there's lots of different goals that you can have, but without knowing what you want to do next year from a business perspective, budgeting becomes silly. Yeah, Some I mean, budgeting. Yeah, go ahead. Keith. Well, I was going to say, you know, you and I are small business owners and, you know, we joke around about the conversations about acquisitions and what the future is going to hold in legal for, you know, non-lawyer ownership and yada, yada, yada. But the lawyers that are going to survive the day are the ones who can articulate their practice in business terms. And so lawyers hate this. A lot of some, I think I shouldn't say that, you know, we always give lawyers such a hard time and they're our best friends and I'm a lawyer, but you better be focused on profitability. And so if your budget isn't considered in a context of target profitability, you can end up really shooting yourself in the foot because at the end of the day, if you're not profitable over a long enough period of time, you're probably not going to be in business anymore. Right. Right. The simple and simplistic budgeting tools is percentage of revenue growth, right? Which again, can miss profitability. That's like, all right, every year we want to grow by 10%, right? That's simple, easy, doesn't require much thought. Another one, Guy, would be the percentage of your revenue that you're going to apply to marketing. Now, those numbers are available in some of these. Is, is that one of the ABA tech report? Is that a number out of there? Or is that, a, I know that's numbers in Clio, right? Like uh, suggested budget as a percentage yeah. of revenue. I yeah. don't know. If it, I don't think it's in the, the text report. I don't remember if it's in the Clio Grow, but I know the ABA does publish on this. But Clio yeah. probably publishes on it too, even if it's Somewhere. on their report. Another resource, the SBA, SBA.gov, they publish all sorts of stuff. And and again, you know, because I was going to ask you, I was like, what's your rule of thumb on this? 
You got to be careful though, because you know all practices, businesses, firms are different. But do you have a rule of thumb on revenue? I, I usually think of it in context of percentage of gross revenue, so after direct costs. But what do you think? I don't use it as a budgeting rule. I think it's it's somewhat simplistic, and it is so contextually relevant. Like if you're if what I'll call a Walmart of law, where you're doing tons of volume at very low margin and you're paying your lawyers as little as you possibly can, your marketing budget needs to be very high. Conversely, if you are a boutique provider that uh, has a sterling reputation and you're looking for a small number of high margin clients, your reality is very different. So I don't like looking at at it this way, but at the very least, it's a quantifiable number, right? Got to start somewhere. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. A couple other numbers from here. Go. 13% of respondents say no one is responsible for marketing in their firm. 32% of solos, no one is responsible. Most solos, 66% do their own marketing. And over 73% of attorneys from firms of 2 to 8 and 10 to 49 lawyers say lawyers perform marketing tasks. So I think that's that stands to reason. This is a, um, you know, it's a personal professional branding type of business. And so I think that it's good for lawyers to be involved in the process. But guess what? If no one is responsible, then don't be surprised if you're not hitting your marketing numbers. Let's cut to break. But while we cut to break, I want you to put a number in your head. Think about what that number should represent for next year. If you don't know what the answer to that question is, spend some time thinking about that as we cut to break. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both English and Spanish. Alert uses proven intake methods, customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866 827 5568 or visit alertcommunications.com forward slash LTN. All right. Now we're going to talk about, and the reason we get the naughty rating from the podcast services, because we use naughty language, especially for our titles, dumb shit lawyers do. So one of the things that I'm dealing with right now, Guy, I see this a lot, and I know you've been really more involved in the intake management software business than I have, you know this really well, is I think a lot of lawyers think of intake management software as the solution, and it's really just part of the solution. And I'm going to get super tactical on this. In almost all intake management software, there is a field or there should be a field for marketing source, right? And I'm still talking to lawyers who are manually inputting marketing source by asking their prospective clients, how did you find me? Now, Guy and I, we had a fight about where did you find me, a small fight about where did you find me a couple episodes ago. But the reality is if you can figure this correctly, if you have a sophisticated marketing reporting infrastructure, not only can you get more accurate data on that, but that can be automatically populated. We call it automagically in the tech world. That can be automatically populated into your intake management software, which gives you two things. One, more accuracy because your reporting infrastructure is telling you where they came from and it's not just the internet or Google, which is super, super unhelpful. And two, your very caring intake management person doesn't stop the conversation about, wow, I'm really sorry you were hurt in that car accident. Where did you find us on the internet? Which is why I hate this question so much. So if you are still asking your clients, where did you find me? And you're using an intake management software, you're missing 90% of the value of that intake management software. (laughs) This old sad trombone. And how does this uh, intake management software actually track intake by source and medium. Yeah. And this is where you need, like I try and get a lot of lawyers to do most of what we do by themselves because they can, right? You can write content better than we can, blah, blah, blah. But if you're using a call rail, 
for example, to track inbound phone calls. If you are using sophisticated form tracking, you know, or you might even use, ready, ready for a key? UTM parameters. That's what I was setting you up for. I know. I, I didn't see it at first. I went to call rail and then I, 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 I smelled like, the this? setup. Okay. If you use those parameters, that information can get fed into your call rail. It can get fed into your Google Analytics account. It can get fed into your intake management software through form fails, chat, whatever it might be. So this is very, very doable. And yet I don't know. It's very rare that I run across a law firm that's automating this process. They're doing it manually and they're getting crappy data. Right. So mine is renting your stuff. And renting your stuff means your Google Ads account, your Google My Business account, your G Suite account, your email. Are you setting me up again? I am. Let me say two more and then you can tell your story. <laughs> content, data, content management system. I, I can't tell you how frustrating it is when a lawyer comes to us and we're like, we can't help you because you're completely locked out of all of your stuff. Conrad, do you have a story to tell about this? I do have a story. This happened last night. I got a, a panicked email from a personal email account from a client of mine. Brand new client. We've been working with them for six weeks, maybe. Their previous agency in leaving basically shut the door on access to Gmail and Drive and was basically like, eh, screw you. Now, that's a super, super extreme, which means this law firm literally cannot receive email and they cannot access their work. The workaround for this, the deal with this, which I'm currently working with them through, is a three to five day business day at best process to prove to Google that you actually have ownership of the domain. But this happens in all sorts of areas, Guy. Like, give some examples of where you don't have access to this and why it's so important. Google Ads, right? So your the agency claims, oh, it's on you're on our proprietary Google Ads account. No, that's your data. It's your account. It's your you're paying for that. Um, your website. Right, you're on a proprietary CMS, and they block you out of your own website and say, "Keep paying us until, you know, whatever." They never actually say, "Stop paying us." And and to the agencies and vendors that are doing this stuff, stop! Stop! This is this should not be happening. People are being taken advantage. And again, you know, we're going to get. I'm sure we're going to get the the hate mail on. Well, you know, it says in our agreement. It's like, well, change your agreement. Like this is not the right way to do things. Lawyers own your data, own your websites, own your content, own your email. Don't give ownership permissions on Google My Business so that, you know, you're frozen out of your local pack. I mean, this can be this stuff can be really damaging to your, you know, if you're in email, you can't even do the work, but certainly from a marketing standpoint, it's just not just not good. It's terrible. I mean, you should know better by now, too, by the way. Yeah, and and I'll I'll I'm going to riff on the ownership of the site. So many of the, some some of these agreements say, "Hey, if you want, you can pay us 2,000 or 5,000 dollars. We'll download the site and send it to you," which would be great if they were using something like WordPress, but they're not. They're using their own system. So it's I'm trying to come up with a good analogy. They're they're going to send you a bunch of useless crap, right? You can't work with this stuff. And the downside with ending with dumb shit lawyers do is we need to end this in a positive note, Guy. So we need to stretch for this. My stretch here is go into relationships with your vendors assuming you're going to break up. You have to assume that you're going to break up because if you don't assume that you're going to break up at some point in time, you're opening yourself up for failure. Have a, have a great marriage, have that commitment to your spouse, but don't have that commitment to your marketing vendor. That's still not happy enough. Can you close this with a happy key? I'm not happy <laughs> key. Um, well, you know, I think the good news is, is that if you, you know, just getting it back to the tech report, some of the trends and the numbers in there are good. So lawyers are getting it, you know, having done this now for over 12 years, 2007, 2008, the sophistication level that has changed is improved a lot. And so I think that these lawyers getting taken advantage of uh, less and less, but still some room to grow. So stay tuned. You know, if you share this podcast, if you got someone that you think needs to hear about the tech stuff and contact us, you know, we're happy to help you walk through sorting some of these issues out, but stay safe out there. 
And with that, have a great month. We will talk to you again in a month. But in the interim, subscribe to the podcast, share it with your friends, leave us a review wherever you get access to those podcasts. We might even read it for you next time. So from Guy and Conrad, this is Lunch Hour Legal Marketing signing off till next year. Thank you for listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. If you'd like more information about what you heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Follow Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Workers' Comp Matters is a podcast dedicated to exploring the laws, the landmark cases, and the true stories that define our workers' compensation system. I'm Judd Pierce, and together with Alan Pierce, we host a different guest each month as we bring to life this diverse area of the law. Join us on Workers' Comp Matters on the Legal Talk Network.